Howdy! Thanks for all the feedback on my last video where I explained why money growth does not cause inflation. Now I was going to include a recap here, but I decided this segment ended up being so long as it was that I decided not to do it. In fact, this one ended up being so long I decided to do it as two. It was going to be just one follow-up video on what actually causes inflation. It's going to be two. Now, in terms of that last video, let me just say that it was a hard-hitting expose of the argument put together by Milton Friedman and his gang of outlaw monetarists centering on the idea that money growth causes inflation. Well, friends, it doesn't. And if you'd like to see more on that, you can either look back at the previous video or you can do one of them Google searches. Put in John Harvey and the word Forbes, because i got a blog out there, uh, and then uh, some combination of money growth does not cause inflation. Now, I've got a much more detailed explanation there. Now, I'll try to remember to put that link here in the description of this video. Well, on to business. Well, if inflation is not a function of out-of-control printing presses, then what is it? Well, in the last video, I started with the theory and then compared that to the real world. This time, I'm going to do the opposite. We're going to start with the real world and then build a theory based on that. And, I, and I'm thinking particularly why I want to do this is because I think you already know what causes inflation. But those danged ivory tower intellectuals have forced this old money growth leads to inflation thing into your head and it's hijacked your thinking on it. So I think you're going to have sort of a gut sense of the way it really works. Now, in my next two videos here, uh, including this one, I'm going to focus on two major historical examples of inflation and then draw from those, all right? And uh, in this one, uh, those of you that are as old as me, you probably remember what was the worst uh, episode of inflation since World War II, and that was, of course, the oil crisis following on the heels of the 1973 Yom Kippur Arab-Israeli War. Here you go. I know many of you also on the game, Sinai. It's all, sorry, Sinai. It's all about them Arab-Israeli wars, what they done had. Uh, and then here's a, here's a tactical level game. Some people play Scrabble. I play Sinai. So, going back to the war. So we've got this uh, uh, 1973 Arab-Israeli war. And them Arab countries got real upset that we helped the good people of Israel. Uh, that's where Jesus died, by the way. Uh, and so they punished the West by restricting the supply of oil. Well, now, for people outside of Texas where they don't have oil running in the streets like we do, it was an outright catastrophe. And by the end of 73, and remember, the embargo doesn't even start till the end of the year. By the end of 73, the oil price has already gone up by 8%. In 74, they rose by 29%. Um, by the way, this is not barrels of oil. Barrels of oil went up a lot more than that. I'm giving you the final consumer price by the time it worked its way through the pipeline and so forth. So this would be like your uh, combination of, of the price of gas, the, the price of heat and oil, price of electricity and so forth. I think that's much more relevant to you and me what the consumer actually paid. All right, so anyway, back to story. 1975, energy prices rose by another 11% which was, of course, on top of the previous 29 and 8% increases. Our misery was rising faster than President Trump can burn through a cabinet. Now, before the power of OPEC cartel finally dwindled, prices had again risen by 7, 9, 6, 25, 30, and 13. That brings us through 1981. And I want to remind you that these price increases are compounding on top of each other. And to give you an idea of the effect of that, had a gallon of gas been just $1 in 1973, by the end of 1981, it would have been $3.64. Now, what caused that inflation? Did someone at the Fed leave the printer on overnight? Did Arthur Burns, the chair at the time, come in and see this big pile of money and exclaim, oh my God, imagine the inflation it's going to cause? Of course not. OPEC caused the inflation, pure and simple. The single most dramatic and impactful experience with inflation was no more caused by monetary policy than toads cause warts. Witches do that. But you knew in your gut already what caused the inflation, did you? Except them dang so-called experts told you otherwise. And that now, interestingly, interestingly, that said, while OPEC caused this inflation, the money supply did rise. I mean, think about this. Imagine. You're an entrepreneur, and let's say that you're accustomed to borrowing working capital from the bank every month. Every month you borrow and you use that money to buy, uh, to hire labor, buy inputs, uh, you sell what the output you, you produce with that, and then you repay the loan. And then you just keep turning this over and over. Very common scenario in the real world. Now, as this entrepreneur, what, what are you going to do after the oil embargo in terms of how much you borrow? 
You're going to go into your banker and you're going to say, hey, I know I've been borrowing 100000 at the start of each month, but with these rising prices, I'm going to need more. Can I get 125000 And this would have been happening all over the country. Not this country here, it's a different one. Uh, all over the country, and not just with entrepreneurs, but with consumers as well. And bankers understood that this was a legitimate request, and in the majority of incidents where they thought that the customer was still a good risk, they accommodated these requests. Now, it gets a little complicated here, and I don't really want to go into how banking works right now because it takes a while, and I've already done an earlier video on it anyway. I believe it might be video number two. I can't remember. Anyway, suffice it to say that, that throughout this process, even when banks weren't able to generate the requisite funds, the Federal Reserve bought government debt from those banks so that they could have those uh, loans being made. Bottom line, and of course, when banks make loans, that increase in money supply. When the Fed buys treasury bills from the banks, that increase in money supply. Bottom line, there was an increase in the money supply, but it was in response to the rise in prices. Now, by the way, this is not my idea. This has uh, been a staple of post-Keynesian economic theory for decades. For example, there is a classic paper by Paul Davidson and Sidney Weintraub in the 1973 Economic Journal. It's a very clever name for a journal. It's just called the Economic Journal, which covers this very phenomenon. The late post-Keynesian economist Basil Moore wrote extensively on this issue. I mean, hell, it's just run the mill standard econ uh, for the folks in this school of thought. And this is the stuff what ought to have been assigned in my graduate program and not that crap Friedman paper I wrote. But anyway, that, that, that's uh, water under the bridge now. And doesn't that story make a whole lot more sense? That all that inflation in the 1970s uh, and into the early 1980s, that was caused by OPEC. That wasn't because they raised the money supply or something like that. All right. But let's step back a moment here. Let's play devil's advocate. What if the Fed had not undertaken the policies that helped the money supply rise along with the prices? What had they not seen to it that banks could accommodate these new demands for loans? Would that have stopped the inflation? Well, it's possible it would have tempered it. It would have meant that if the Fed hadn't created this accommodative atmosphere, it would have meant that the borrowers would have had a more difficult time getting funding as those prices rose. This would have led to an even bigger decline in economic activity than we actually experienced. Firms would not have been able to have hired as many workers or buy as many inputs. There would have been more layoffs and deeper economic contraction. And when people have less income, there's less purchasing power and less upward pressure on prices. Yay! There's less inflation if we plunge the economy into a recession. That doesn't sound like a good idea, does it? Tempering the inflationary impact of the OPEC oil embargo by refusing entrepreneurs' demands for increased funding for production is not a logical policy. And prices would have still gone up some anyway, just would have tempered it. All right, well, let's kind of take stock of where we are right now. What caused the inflation? OPEC. But well, let's generalize on that so that we have a theory rather than a story. It was the market power, the ability to avoid competitive pressures, that caused the inflation, that allowed OPEC to do this. Think about it. What if there had been 10 times as many countries that exported oil back then as really did? I mean, at the time, uh, six or seven dominated the whole uh, industry. Well, make that 60 or 70. Now I try to get them to agree on quotas so they can reduce the supply of oil and drive up the price. Even if you got them started down that road, as the price rose, so there would be a tremendous temptation to cheat and to sell more oil at this new higher price. Others would see this, they would think it was unfair, and they'd also cheat, until eventually the whole dang thing collapsed and prices fell right back to where they started. Well, this is what happens when we have competition, which is the way it's supposed to work, all right? It's much easier to rein in the rogue producers when there's only six or seven as opposed to 60 or 70. And so, you can, when you can avoid competition, you can cause inflation. But what are some modern examples of this? Uh, the, the industries that face comparatively little competition and thereby can cause inflation by raising price. Well, I think these will sound familiar to you. Pharmaceuticals, airlines, cable TV internet providers, uh, cell phone service providers, healthcare industry, just to name a few of what we call oligopolistic industries, very little competition. Uh, now, they don't form cartels like OPEC did and restrict supply, because that's illegal here in God's country. But as Adam Smith, the father of capitalism, once wrote, people of the same trade seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion, which sounds fun, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices, all right? So making it illegal 
uh, to, to collude. Doesn't, it just makes it more difficult, doesn't make it impossible. And, and there's all kinds of fascinating theories and so forth about price leaders and so on, which we ain't got time for. Now, here's the last question of the day. What is the impact of this kind of inflation? Different kinds of inflation have different kind of impact, right? And many, if not most people, believe that inflation makes everyone worse off. It absolutely does not. Okay, remember, think about this. If you're paying more, somebody else is what? Getting more. When you're the one buying the hamburger, the price of the hamburger is your expenditure. When you're the one selling the hamburger, the price of the hamburger is your income. So for the system as a whole, the inflation game is a zero sum game. But all the individual prices in different sectors, they don't all rise at the same time or at the same rate. Some folks absolutely end up better off. Now, we don't need to have some deep analysis here to figure out who was better off in the 70s. It was OPEC the OPEC countries, and the folks in the oil industry in general. Well, back when I started college in 1979, uh, the crisis was still ongoing. Everybody and his or her brother and sister was majoring in geology so they could get a piece of that pie. And as so I step back and look at this from a more aggregated, or I guess disaggregated perspective to break down the different kinds of uh, inflation rates during this period. Now the numbers they show you on TV as inflation, those are averages of all commodity types. What if we broke down by sector during this 1973 to 1982 period, uh, what inflation was? For energy prices alone, inflation was 364% over this period, this decade here. Non-energy prices, only went up by 222%. Now that's still a lot, but don't forget, they're having to jack up prices just because their energy prices went up. But think about that. If I'm an energy producer, what I sell is going up in price by 364, and what I buy is going up in price by 222, and flip that around, all right? So clearly, the net effect was that income was redistributed from the non-energy energy sectors into the energy sector. It was not a net loss for all of society, but certain groups gained from it, the energy sector. And the Fed, slowing money growth was not going to change that because money growth didn't cause it in the first place. All right. Now, next time I want to talk about a very different kind of inflation, the sort caused by high levels of demand. Well, that sounds like more fun than being in the middle seat between Donald Trump and Boris Johnson on a 14-hour flight. Donald, put that Sharpie away. Your ticket does not say that you're entitled to my snacks. Boris, I'm declaring a hard border between our armrests or I'll Brexit your ass out the window. Thank you.